Thank you for tuning in to the video introduction of my book, The Solution, How to Make the U.S. Quickly Reach Its High Economic and Social Potential. You can read the book for free on my website, edwardsonino.com. Please excuse me if in doing this video introduction I read from text, since I don't have a teleprompter. It's the only way I can be as concise as possible. I hope you'll take the time to read my book because I'm convinced you'll find that it contains the, de the detailed reforms which would lead to rapid economic growth, prevent long recessions and high unemployment, solve our social problems, and greatly improve our foreign policy. It's the detailed platform I would want our next president to implement. It's the platform I would personally run on if I had sufficient popular support. Unfortunately, our presidential candidates never have detailed platforms. They only have vague platforms, which are just wish lists and empty promises with no concrete, detailed solutions for the nation's problems. That's why we never solve our problems. I firmly believe that any candidate without a detailed platform is a person with no idea how to solve the nation's problems and whose main reason for running is personal ambition. Another preliminary point I'd like to make is that it's a common fallacy to believe that a president doesn't need to be an expert in economic, foreign, and social policy himself or herself. That all a president, need, a president needs to be successful is to be intelligent and have good advisors. That theory clearly doesn't work. Otherwise, all our presidents would have been successful and all our problems would have been solved. In fact, consider this. If presidents are not very knowledgeable in their own right, how can they really tell who would be a good advisor and how would they be able to optimally digest, analyze, and synthesize advice from inside and outside their administrations? I believe that to be highly qualified, a presidential candidate must be an expert in economic, foreign, and social policy, not just intelligent. We clearly need all our presidential candidates to be highly qualified. We cannot afford more unqualified presidents who invariably end up making huge policy mistakes and never solve our nation's problems, even though they are intelligent individuals. I'll now introduce you to some of the reforms I am convinced will solve our nation's problems, but I urge you to take the time to read the book, since it carefully details the reforms and explains how they would work. First, regarding economic policy. High unemployment and long recessions are not inevitable phenomena. The right economic policies can keep unemployment always under 5% and prevent economic slowdowns from plunging into recessions. One key policy is to have the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury use QE finance tax rebates as the standard stimulus tool whenever the unemployment rate rises above 5%. For example, had the $800 billion Obama stimulus program in 2009 consisted entirely of a tax rebate each taxpayer would have received a $5,000 check from the IRS. A household with two taxpayers would have received two checks for a total of $10,000. That would have immediately stimulated the economy and ended the recession while stopping the housing crisis in its tracks. In fact, families in financial difficulty would have had the means to avoid defaulting on their monthly mortgage payments, and all taxpayers would have had uh, additional personal income to keep consumption from contracting. The recession would have been very brief and unemployment would have been kept low. Sustained economic growth with low unemployment and avoiding deep recessions thanks to the proper use of QE finance tax rebates is by far the best way to raise everyone's standard of living to strengthen the middle class and to eliminate poverty. Gross economic mismanagement is the cause of the middle class malaise we have been experiencing over the past few years due to the failure to understand that the problem was declining personal income and consumption, and that consequently, the solution was large QE finance tax rebates. Income inequality is a red herring. Income inequality is not the cause of the middle class's economic difficulties. The wealthy are not taking away from the middle class and the poor. The middle class and the poor have been suffering only because of recession and high unemployment. Wages will rise when the economy is strong and unemployment low. The best economic system is free market capitalism combined with an economic policy that ensures sustained economic growth and low unemployment. Bad economic policy obscures this reality and undermines con confidence in the free market free enterprise system. Bad economic policy is pernicious 
the most egregious example being what has been happening in the Eurozone and not just in Greece. But it has been pernicious in our nation as well. Some chapters of my book deal with the economic policy mistakes of the Eurozone and the solution for Greece and the other Eurozone nations suffering from deep recession and ex extremely high unemployment, up to 50% youth unemployment and 25% overall unemployment. The beauty of QE Finance tax rebates as the standard stimulus tool is that apart from being instantly effective, they are virtually cost-free, since QE consists of Federal Reserve financing which does not increase the nation's real debt, as explained in the book. Also, it is the only fair form of stimulus. In fact, there is no discrimination, no favored categories, as each and every taxpayer receives the exact same rebate check. That means that QE finance tax rebates can be used as often as necessary and no one, no one will have reason to complain. With QE finance tax rebates as the standard stimulus tool, we will never again have deep recessions and high unemployment. You may be skeptical now, but I'm sure you won't be if you read the book since it explains how QE works and why it is cost-free without being inflationary when properly calibrated. Second, regarding social policy. There are various crucially important, important reforms detailed and explained in the book. One, to ensure consistently high standards of police performance throughout the nation and avoid incidents of excessive force by the police, we need a federally financed National Police Academy. Academy training would be at a high level and mandatory for all local police officers. Two, to end poverty and violent crime, we need federally financed universal preschool Head Start with high standards. We also need federally financed individual tutoring, mentoring for students having low grades. We need federally financed after school activities in the arts and sports, including on weekends, holidays, and summer vacation in order to make sure that our youth do not get involved in crime. We need federal financing because the states do not have the financial means for such programs. We also need to ensure uniformly high standards throughout the nation. Three, to ensure having well-adjusted, self-aware, and empathetic youth, we need a federally financed four-year high school course in psychology, which includes group therapy classes. This also serves to spot students with severe emotional problems and help them overcome their difficulties. This program would serve to avoid the recurring tragedies we have endured of disturbed youths going on shooting rampages. The course should also include a section on logic, ethics, morality, manners, and individual responsibility. Four, to greatly re raise our educational level and successfully compete in the global economy, we need to encourage much higher academic standards. One way is to have a prestigious national high school curriculum and graduation test. Schools will most probably voluntarily adopt the national curriculum because students will want to obtain a prestigious national high school degree which attests significant academic achievement. Our high school degrees must not be meaningless pieces of paper, as is all too often the case. All schools must adopt the formula of successful schools, firm discipline and lots of homework. It helps to have school uniforms. School must be seen as serious business and student need to dress the part. This is especially helpful for many underprivileged youth who can then more easily see themselves becoming university graduates and having a distinguished career. All our children must go to college and graduate no matter what career they wish to pursue. That is essential for our country to prosper economically and socially and to successfully compete in the global economy. To a youth who wants to be a, more, a car mechanic, for example, I'd say, first go to college and get your degree, then work as a car mechanic. If you go to college and get a liberal arts education, you'll reach a higher level of competence in whatever you end up doing, and you'll find life much more interesting and enjoy it more. Having taught economics and investing in five failing public high schools as a volunteer, I saw firsthand what the problem is in failing schools. There is no class discipline and practically no homework is done. Not one of my 150 junior and senior students had learned how to work with fractions and percentages. That's incredible. What does that say about failing public schools? It says that the problem is lack of discipline and lack of lots of homework. It's as simple as that. Somehow, nobody in government acknowledges that. I'll say it once more. 
Failing public schools fail only because they do not impose firm, firm discipline and don't assign and review lots of homework. Lots of homework is absolutely essential for academic success. Five, to ensure that all our citizens and politicians are fully knowledgeable about human rights, all high schools must have a course on the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the history of human rights violations. This is crucially important both for our own society's harmoniousness and for our foreign policy. So third, regarding foreign policy. To have a successful foreign policy, we need to put the emphasis on human rights and have the United Nations strictly enforce its own human rights charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which all too many members are systematically violating, even explicitly, with their own laws and regulations. Emphasis on human rights is the way to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, to undermine Islamic terrorism, to reinforce democracy, and to end much human suffering in conflict. If you're skeptical about this book, about this point, just read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and you'll probably see the wisdom. You'll see why putting the spotlight on the Universal Declaration, which all members of the United Nations have undersigned and pledged to uphold, would be such an effective tool. The Universal Declaration is in the appendix of the book. We need to finally and truly engage in the war of ideas in order for democracy and human rights to prevail worldwide and specifically to undermine Islamic extremism. We need a major public relations campaign to discredit religious discrimination and violence and Islamic terrorism in particular. We need to sponsor televised debates between the Israelis and Palestinians to narrow their differences and misunderstandings. And we should encourage them to hold a series of parallel referendums on what type of compromises they could accept for true reconciliation and lasting peace. That is the only way to marginalize the extremists who refuse compromise and to uh, democratically empower the silent majority, which is most desirable of compromise and peace. It would be very helpful for our presidents to regularly engage in one-on-one -on -one televised debates without a moderator with the political leaders of other nations, particularly of nations with which we have problematic relations, such as Putin's Russia. That would help reduce misunderstandings and potential conflicts and allow citizens to directly evaluate the leaders and the policies of both sides. Public opinion will reward the leaders with the most moral and logical ideas. As for Iraq, the only way for stability is for it to split into three sovereign nations, Northern Iraq Kurdistan, Sunni Central Iraq, and Shiite Southern Iraq. As luck would have it, all three parts of Iraq have their own oil fields, facilitating a breakup. The Iraqi Kurds deserve to have their own nation, having been denied, been denied sovereignty for so long, and having shown they are civilized and respectful of human rights. As for Libya, its oil should be privatized and the shares distributed equally to Libyan citizens. Its civil war is all about controlling that country's oil wealth, and only a fair system of sharing that wealth will end the violence. One could say the same about Iraq's ongoing civil war. Finally, the U.S. must have unquestioned military superiority in training, preparedness, technology, and numbers, given a world full of aggressive nations which are not democratic and don't respect human rights. Fourth, regarding tax reform. To have optimal economic growth and fairness, we need tax reform. We need to replace the income and estate taxes with a 5% federal sales tax. A sales tax is inherently progressive since the wealthier one is, the more one spends, and the more sales taxes one pays. A 5% federal sales tax can be made even more progressive by sending an annual sales tax rebate of $1,000, that's 5% of $20,000, to all taxpayers earning less than $20,000. In this way, citizens with low incomes will end up paying no federal taxes at all, neither income taxes nor sales taxes. Replacing income and estate taxes greatly improves our economic efficiency and tax fairness by eliminating tax shelters used by the wealthy, which lead to a gross misallocation of financial and human capital. 
replacing the income and estate taxes with a 5% federal sales tax will bring about an economic boom. By the way, income taxes are surely unconstitutional, even though the Supreme Court has yet to determine that. Being in violation of the Fifth, fifth Amendment's no-taking clause, while the Sixteenth Amendment, which instituted the income tax in 1913, only addressed the apportionment requirement without overturning the no-taking clause. The Constitution only envisaged sales taxes up until the Sixteenth Amendment, evidencing the fundamental principle that private property should not be taxed. Income, obviously, is private property. Meanwhile, the estate tax is so clearly in violation of the Constitution that the legislators introducing the estate tax consciously made a run around the Constitution by twisting reality, asserting that the estate tax is not a tax on property, but on the transfer of estate property. That assertion is transparently bogus and fraudulent. In fact, if the estate tax were truly a tax on the transfer of estate property, all the time and value references for the tax would not be based on the date of death, as is the case, but on the date of transfer. In any case, the estate tax is against the Constitution's spirit and guiding principle, which is that private property is not to be taxed. Sadly, our legislators have not always been above defrauding citizens in order to increase tax revenues. Fifth, on political reform. To have a truly democratic systems where, uh, system where citizens are in full charge, not political parties, we need political reform. There should be no restrictions on write-in candidates. This is easy with computerized voting, where every voting center uses specially programmed tablets listing all candidates and allowing voters to write in the candidate of their choice instead of selecting one of the listed candidates. We also need to level the playing field between incumbents and their challengers. In fact, incumbents always start off re-election campaigns with an enormous advantage. The way to, do, the way to level the playing field is to limit an incumbent spend, uh, campaign spending to half the amount spent by the top spending challenger and require a minimum of three primetime televised debates between incumbents and their challengers. When there is no incumbent, in order to ensure a fairly level playing field, no candidate can spend more than the amount spent by the other candidates combined, and all candidates are required to participate in a minimum of three primetime televised debates. Sixth, on crime reduction and prison reform, to greatly reduce recidivism, which exceeds 50%, we need drastic prison reform. Prisons should have mandatory full-time, high-quality educational programs. All time spent in prison must be highly constructive educationally and psychologically. Having volunteered to teach economics, investing in constitutional law in a state prison, I saw firsthand that prisons are not run the way they ought to be. Rehabilitation programs are woefully inadequate. How we run our prisons reflects our level of civility, morality, and practical intelligence. We are grossly underachieving in that regard. Seventh, on the death penalty. It should be clear that the death penalty is unconstitutional in violation of the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishments. How can putting a defenseless prisoner to death not be cruel? It is also unusual since life imprisonment is by far the prevalent punishment. The death penalty, apart from being unconstitutional, even though the Supreme Court has not yet pronounced it to be unconstitutional, is also clearly immoral and inhumane. It also goes against our fundamental principles of mercy and redemption. All prisoners must be given the chance and unlimited time to redeem themselves morally and intellectually. In fact, prisons must be run so as to help the prisoners redeem themselves. How we treat prisoners reflects our level of civility and morality. The, the death penalty is medieval, barbaric, and counterproductive, giving the appalling message that life is not sacred all the while not being a deterrent. Eighth, on sexual discrimination. There must be no discrimination against gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and transsexuals. Such discrimination is in violation of human rights. Ninth, on humane treatment of all animals. All animals must be protected from inhumane treatment. How we treat animals reflects our level of civility and morality. Tenth, on abortion. We must encourage adoption over abortion. 
there should be no abortion debate. Abortions, especially after the first month, are clearly morally and psychologically troubling, and adoption is the clear desirable alternative. With contraception widely available, a well-educated nation should have very few unwanted pregnancies. Most of our unwanted pregnancies, in fact, occur among uneducated youth. One more reason to make sure all our youth get an excellent education. We must eliminate the dropout phenomenon once and for all. Eleventh, on immigration. The best way to deal with Ill Ill illegal immigration is to have high-tech ID social security cards and make them a requirement for obtaining driver's licenses, bank accounts, credit cards, phone numbers, social services, and employment, with employers required to communicate their employees' IDs to a national database. As for illegal immigrants currently employed and law-abiding, a way must be found to allow them to remain in the country. On another front, it's in the interest of our economy to make it easy for well-educated foreign professionals to obtain green cards, especially those who have advanced, uh, who, especially those who have ob obtained advanced degrees from American universities. As for foreigners who wish to immigrate to the United States, we should make it easy for them to apply online and verify their position on the immigration waiting list. Twelfth, on gun control. As for the gun control debate, it is a waste of time. Gun control would be ineffective. There will always be a black market for guns, just as there is for illegal drugs, and just as there was for alcohol under prohibition. The only way to greatly reduce gun violence is to have a well-educated, mentally well-adjusted citizenry, along with a strong economy and low unemployment. Everyone should realize that there is no effective shortcut for eliminating gun violence. I realize you might initially be skeptical or not understand or not agree with my proposals, but if you read the book carefully, I believe you will end up agreeing with much, if not all, of my platform. I would be very interested and grateful to receive your comments. You can email me at edwardsonino2016 at yahoo.com that's spelled E-D-W-A-R-D-S-O-N-N-I-N-O-2016 at yahoo.com. And I will do my best to respond. If I receive enough enthusiastic support, I will dedicate myself to influencing the 2016 presidential election in order for the platform to be adopted by our next president. We, we would then be on the road to quickly solve our nation's problems and to reach our high potential for economic and social prosperity. I hope you'll give me your enthusiastic support and thank you for your attention. You can follow me on Twitter, at Edward Sonino, and on my YouTube channel, and see my personal profile on LinkedIn. I am sincerely yours, Edward Sonino.